Have you ever felt like you had to do something to earn somebody's love? Maybe it was a parent, maybe it was a boss or a coworker, or maybe even a spouse. Well, I want to encourage you today and bring you some relief by letting you know that there is nothing that you have to do to earn God's love. He loves you. And that's what tonight's More Monday is going to be about. It's about understanding, becoming aware of the incredible love of God. So for the last, I believe, five or six weeks, we have been studying the attributes of our Heavenly Father. Because I believe when we become aware of who He really is, it'll change how we live. It'll change how we feel about ourselves. It'll change how we react with other people. And so, so far, we have already touched on these things. We've talked about God being our good shepherd. He's the one that's guiding us through life, protecting us and providing for us. We've also talked about him being God. You know, he's all powerful, he's all knowing, and he's everywhere. And that shouldn't scare us. That should bring us a lot of peace to know that God is looking out for us wherever we are, providing for us. Nothing is impossible for him. But we've also talked about him being our covering. Love covers him covering all of our sin. And also we've talked about him being the door, the way to a new life, the way, the truth, and the life. And then last week, or two weeks ago actually, I talked about Jack Murphy. And I, I talked about him in relation to our God giving us gifts. And Jack Murphy was one of those gifts that God gave me, Murph the Surf. He was one of the premier prison ministers in this world. And God put him in my life. And what a gift he was. So in the... Um, in the concept or context, excuse me, I guess I should say, of our awareness series, I talked about Jack, one, to honor him because he had recently passed, but also to just share how God is a God who gives good gifts. He gives everything that we need in the form of relationships and people and money, opportunities, doors opening. He is there. And so I had a lot of fun with that last week, honoring my dear friend and celebrating his life, but I hope that you learned a lot from it as well. Well, tonight I want to close up our awareness series on God. There's so much more. I could go forever, but I do believe we need to bring it to a close, and I want to shift from the next time from being aware of who God is to being aware of who we are because we are God's child, and that's what we're going to talk about tonight is God being our Father our Heavenly Father, someone who loves us. Now, many of you watching may not have had a father like I had. And I thought that that was normal until I started going into prison ministry. And I, I, I mean, I knew that my father was unique because my dad, very much like I talked about Jack Murphy last time, my dad has taught me so much in life, and God blessed me with a wonderful father. And so it's been easy for me as I've gone into my relationship with God as a heavenly father to understand that God is good because I had a good earthly father. And this is a picture of my earthly father running to me congratulating me, putting his arms around me after I won a jump event. Um, and I was a water skied my whole life. My dad taught me when I was age four, him and some friends, and and competed for 35 years. It was a many, uh, many, many years on the water, doing a lot of amazing things. And it was an amazing journey. Well, in this particular shot, I had just broken a national record. I think I was 12 years old there. My dad just came in. He saw this picture, and he was just smiling. He's like, man, I didn't know I looked that good. <laughs> so, you did, Dad. You had those short white shorts. Um, yeah, so anyway, it was just awesome just seeing him. It, that shot brings me tears because that is really a picture of my dad was always on the banks ready to put his arms around me in victory, but also in defeat. He and my mom were always there, met me on the shoreline with a hug, whether I, whether, um, if I was happy, if I were sad, and so regardless, and I'm just so thankful for that. 
But going through life, when I would envision my heavenly father, I would only envision him running to me in good times. When he would be proud of me, if I did something good, I, I figured that if I messed up, that God must be so disappointed in me. If I made mistakes, that he was really ready to punish me. And I want to share a story tonight, a couple stories. One from the, the life of David, King David, who God described him as a man after my own heart. And I also want to bring in the story of the prodigal son. And a lot of times we focus on the son, what the son did. But tonight I want to focus on the father, the father who was gracious, the father who was full of love and compassion. And that's who our heavenly father is. He is slow to anger, but quick to love, quick to be compassionate, quick to meet us on the banks of our life when we are um, celebrating, when we're rejoicing, but also when we're crying, when we are just so frustrated or maybe angry with ourselves, or maybe we're just so full of burdens and sin and, and we're just overwhelmed. God is there. And he is there to wrap his arms around us, not take his fist and beat us. And so let me say, I, I saw a lot of parents and how they coached their children. And I remember this one um, parent, a couple of parents who were so harsh on their children. And instead of meeting them on the banks with a hug and encouragement and celebration, they would meet them with being berated and punished. I remember this beautiful young girl, and if she didn't do well, her father would make her run laps around the lake and until she competed again. How that would help her, I do not know. She'd be exhausted in that Florida heat before she could go compete again. He was a, a harsh father. But that is not who we have as a heavenly father. So no matter what your background is with an earthly father, I want you to throw that out. I want you to throw it out. Because what we have experienced on earth with our fathers is not who our heavenly father is. Even I have to throw out what I know as my father. I have a good father one who's always been there for me, but my father's not perfect. And he'll be the first to admit that. He makes mistakes. He says things that sometimes he regrets. I say things that sometimes I regret. That's not God. And so no matter who we had, whether we had a good father or whether we had a father who was abusive or a father that was absent, no matter what, he, what our fathers look like or didn't look like, we need to set it aside and we need to go to the Word and we need to realize who God really is. So if we get the awareness of who He is, it'll change everything. Because no longer will we come out of the waters of defeat and go hide. Think about Adam and Eve when they sinned. They went and hid from God. Why? Because they were afraid of Him. No, we can, we can go. We don't have to hide. I mean, sin separates us from God. But Jesus Christ came, and God was living in Jesus Christ, gave His light up, shed His blood for us so that we have forgiveness of sin. So no matter what we have done, we don't need to hide. Because God's blood, Jesus' blood, has already covered it. So we can come out of hiding. We can run to our Father whether we are celebrating or whether we are crying because we are in despair. Maybe we are so full of sin. We can still run to Him and come to Him. And you know what He's going to do? He's going to wrap His arms around you. And so I want you to remember this picture. This is God. This, my dad's not God. But this is a picture of God. He's running toward you. No matter what you've done. He's running. He's wrapping his arms around you. He's celebrating. He's helping you be restored. He's a restoring God. 
if that's the word, a restoring God, a God who restores, a God who redeems, a God who lifts you up out of the pit. He falls in the pit with you and lifts you up. So no matter where you are, no matter what you've done, I want you to get that picture. God is running after you. And so let's look at this picture biblically. If you have your Bibles, and I hope you do, you ought to know by now, on Monday nights, we go deep into God's Word. I want you to turn to the parable of the lost son, and that is in Luke 15 and starts in verse 11. And so this is in the context of Jesus talking to his disciples and the people. He, he's teaching them um, truths. He's teaching them about the kingdom of God. He's teaching them about the love of God. And he's, he starts in chapter 15 of Luke talking about the parable of the lost sheep, how the shepherd goes and finds the sheep. Remember, we talked about God being the good shepherd. Well, the next context is talking about the parable of the lost corn. C not corn, coin. <laughs> My southern really came out. Coin. <laughs> and yes, coin is two syllables not supposed to be. But anyway, the parable of the lost coin. And the lost coin is, in these aspects, in these parables, the picture that Jesus has given to us is that if something is lost, or someone is lost, our Heavenly Father is looking for us. He's going to us. He wants to bring you in to his fold. He wants you to bring you home. And when he does, he has a party. He doesn't beat you. He doesn't berate you. He celebrates. So now we're at the parable of the lost son. This is Luke 15. It starts with chapter, excuse me, chapter 15, verse 11. And then Jesus says, to illustrate the point further, Jesus told them this story. I'm going to lift this up so I can look you in the eyes. It says, a man had two sons. The younger son told his father, I want my share of the estate now before you died. Before you die. So his father agreed to divide his wealth between his sons. And so the older son would have gotten two-thirds of the estates. He would have gotten double what the younger son would have gotten. So the younger son would have gotten one-third. And I did read today in my studies that it was not unusual for a father to settle his estate before he died. So he did that, and he knew, I, you know that he knew that his younger son was ready to just go sow his oats. He was ready to go. He is demanding from his father, give me what is going to be mine. I want it now. And what I love about the father is even though he knows this is what's going to happen, he gives his son everything. He gives his son everything that was due him. And I think about our Heavenly Father. He went to the cross and he died for us. And he gave to every single one of us, the ones that would be the son that would stay close to the Father and serve their Father well. He gave to that strong you know, believer, if that's what this represents. He gave him salvation, but he also gave the rebellious one salvation at the same time. He gave to all of us everything, knowing that some of us would squander it, some of us would trample over it, and some of us would receive it and stay close to home. And I just love the love of the Father that no matter who we are, God gives us the same love, the same compassion, the same gifts, the same inheritance. And so the, the father gives the son that. says a few days later, so he didn't wait too long, the younger son packed up all his belongings and he leaves. He moved to a distant land and there he wasted all of his money in wild living. I think about all that God has given us and how often we squander it. We waste it. Well, I got good news. God is in the restoring business. He's a compassionate God. And so even though in our past we may have squandered, even in our past we may have wasted, run off and rebelled, God, as we're going to see, is still going to receive us to himself. So he wasted it all. And about the time his money ran out, I'm in, in chapter 14, excuse me, chapter 15, verse 14. About the time his money ran out, a great famine swept over the land, and he began to starve. So we're going to find that the son is in the lowest point of his life. 
He persuaded a local farmer to hire him, and the man sent him into the fields to feed the pigs. Now you got to understand, this, this is a picture of a of Jewish young man who is now, the pigs were seen as completely unholy, disgusting, dirty animals. And now he is working with the pigs. He's feeding the pigs. And then we're going to find he's living with the pigs. And he's eating what the pigs eat. He is at the lowest point that this man could possibly be. The young man became so hungry that even the pods he was feeding the pigs looked good to him, but no one gave him anything. When he finally came to his senses, some versions, I love it, they say, he came to himself. This is the point when we look around at our life and we say, what am I doing? I I did that. I came to a point in my life where I had everything the world would say that I needed to be happy, but the reality is I was sick and tired of being sick and tired. I was so tired of trying to get the world's approval, man's approval, trying to be perfect that I came to my senses and I said, there's got to be something more. That's why I named this More. More Monday. We meet on Monday night, but so we experience more because there is more to life than what I'm experiencing now and what you're experiencing. And that's what the lost son says. He's like, there's got to be more. I've wasted it all. He came to himself. Have you come to yourself? Have you come to a point where you're like, oh my goodness, there has to be more in this life. God, I want to come home. I want to come back to you. I thought it would be better over here, but it's not. And so he came to his senses and he said to himself, he's thinking this through. He says, at home, even the hired servants have food. They have more than enough to spare. Here I am dying of hunger. I'm going to go home and I'm going to say to my father, Father, I have sinned against both you and heaven. And I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Please take me on as a hired servant. So he turned and he went home. He returned home to his father. He returned home. Have we come to our senses yet and are we returning home? What does it mean to return home? It means to turn our back from the world and to go to our father. And here's what I love. Our father is watching He's waiting. It says right here, and while he was still a long way off, while the son was still a long way off, the father saw him. You know what this says to me? The father was looking. He was watching. He was praying. He was waiting, saying, God, bring my son back home. Well, our heavenly father is there, and Jesus is interceding for us and saying, come home. Come home. And God is drawing us to himself. It's time to come home, to quit wasting our resources, wasting our time, wasting our life, and turn and return home to where we belong. And when we do, our Father is watching. He's waiting. And it says right here, while he was a long way off, his Father saw him coming, filled with love and compassion, This is a picture of our Heavenly Father, filled with love, filled with compassion. He ran to his son. He embraced him. He kissed him. And his son said, Father, I have sinned against both heaven and you, and I am no longer worthy to be called his son. But his father said to the servants, quick. Now here's what I noticed today. Quick, immediately, now, right now. Bring the finest robe in the house and put it on him. Get a ring for his finger, sandals for his feet. Kill the calf. We have been fattening. We must celebrate with a feast. For this son of mine was dead and has now returned to life. He was lost, but now he is found. So the party began. I love this because what this shows me that as soon as we turn, as soon as we return, as soon as we come home, our Father quickly restores us. Quickly restores us. And what does He do? I don't know, like me, if maybe you've read this story and you brush past these gifts. Here's what He gave them He gave them a robe. He puts a robe and covers His dirtiness. 
covers. There's no telling what this man looked like. We know he's barefooted. He has no feet. He's barefooted. And, and so he covers him with a robe. This, many theologians believe, is the picture of the robe of righteousness. And it talks about in Isaiah that God covers us with a robe of righteousness. He covers our dirtiness. He covers our sin. He, we take on the cleanliness of Jesus Christ, his righteousness. And that's what this father was doing to his son. He's saying, no, you're not going to be my servant. You're my son, and I'm restoring all the rights of the sonship right now. And when we, t- when we do an awareness series on who we are, we're going to talk more about these. So I'm not going to go into depth tonight. But you got to realize that quickly God restores. He, he puts a robe of the robe of righteousness, the robe. He covers him. He gives him a ring of authority. He says, you're my son. That ring, we're going to go so much detail, but just remember the ring is a sign of authority. He could, he could take wax and seal letters and it would, it would have that authority. It would show that he was a son. And you know what else he got? He got shoes. He got sandals. And these servants, these servants wouldn't have shoes. Why? Because they didn't want him to run away. At least that's what some of the commentaries say. They wouldn't want, so he had no shoes. His shoes would have been taken because he would have been a servant, a slave, and they didn't want him to be running. But you know what? He left being a slave of the world, and he came home and and became a son again. And yes, we serve our Father God through our gifts and our talents and and we serve Him through our lives. But what God wants first and foremost is a relationship as our son, a daughter, a son with our Heavenly Father. So He restores us quick, immediately. He brings you back. When you come back home, He restores all your rights. He doesn't say, you're my hired servant. He says, no, you're my son. You're my daughter. And I love you. And so what else does he do? He makes a sacrifice of the fattened calf. This was something that wasn't always done. We can see from the other son, he was pretty ticked because this son who was once lost and has now come home, um, he's repented of his sin. He's getting the fattened calf and they're having a party. And uh, this other brother is not real happy about it. But we're not going to focus on the other brother and his attitude. But what this shows us is that God, our Heavenly Father, is compassionate He's loving, he's generous, he's kind, he's forgiving, he's watching, he's restoring. If you don't know God as that type of heavenly father, as that type of father, I implore you to get in the word of God and see who he really is. Not through your experiences through a church, not through your experience through Christians, because there are a lot of Christians who have not represented God well. And I am one of those in many times in my life. We all fall short of the glory of God, but thank God her Father loves us and forgives us. We see that in the story with David. And I'm not going to go so deep into David, but David was a man after God's own heart. That's how God described him. He loved David. He chose David. But we see at one point that, and I know there were many times that David probably messed up, but we know a couple of times that were highlighted in the Bible. One we see in 2 Samuel where he has an affair with a married woman, Bathsheba. Bathsheba. And then to cover his, his sin, instead of having God cover it, he tries to hide it. He tries to make it go away, and that doesn't go so well for him. Today I was studying David's life, and I saw when David sinned, instead of going to God and having God restore him and forgive him, he tried to cover it up through his own earthly efforts. And let me tell you something. You end up in the pig style when you do that. You end up in trouble. And so we, if you look at that story, go study it sometimes in 2 Samuel. It's all about David trying to cover his sin with Bathsheba. And first, he, he brings the husband of Bathsheba back off the battlefield. 
He wants to send him home to his wife because he finds out Bathsheba's pregnant. So he has to cover up that, you know, Bathsheba is home alone and her husband is out on the battlefield. So David has to bring him home, brings him off the battlefield and says, go home to your wife. Even sends him some gifts. He was trying to appease to Uriah's desires for his wife, for sex, for um, pleasure. But what he didn't count on was Uriah was a, a man of honor. He's like, how dare I go sleep with my wife while my friends, my soldier friends, uh, my, my comrades are all fighting a war. And he wouldn't go in and sleep with his wife. Well, David's like, uh-oh. So the next stage is David goes and tries to cover it by getting Uriah drunk and sending him home. He's hoping that his, his inhibitions would be low. Well, that didn't work. So what did he do? He ends up killing Uriah. He puts him on the front of battle, has the other soldiers pull back, leaves Uriah exposed, and Uriah is killed. And so this morning I was studying that and I realized, man, this was a huge failure for David. Think about what that cost him because there were people who knew what had happened. There were people like Joab who had to put Uriah out there. He knew David had put him there to be killed. There were people who knew that Bathsheba had been brought in to David's palace and that she was in his private chambers. People knew. And instead of coming clean, he tried to hide it. And what I love is he finally gets to a point where God used the prophet to expose David's sin. And what does David do? He repents. And he asks God to forgive him. And I want us to read, um, let me get this, this other version here um, of the Bible. It's another translation. And I want to read Psalms. 51, and this is a Psalms that David wrote when he was desperate for forgiveness. He had been in the pit. It talks about his body was hurting. Sin was destroying his life. And he comes to God and he says, God, restore to me the joy of my salvation. Restore to me my joy. Bring me back to that place of forgiveness. Cover me. Cover my sin. And we're going to see that what God does is exactly what, what the prodigal son's father does. It's an immediate restoration. Now, there's still consequences. Well, sin brings consequences. But there is still blessing and there's still restoration when we come to God and we ask for forgiveness. So I want to close with Psalms 51. David, this is his heart to God. He says, Be gracious to me, God, according to your faithful love, according to your abundant compassion. Blot out my rebellion. So think about David had rebelled against God. The prodigal son had rebelled against his father. But they're both coming back to their father. And David is saying, God, I need your compassion. I need your love. I need your faithfulness, your gracious, abundant love to cover me. And that's exactly what we see covers the prodigal son. He says, wash away my guilt. You know, guilt is heavy. Guilt was heavy on the prodigal son. He came back. He's like, it had cost him everything. It had cost him his position. It had cost him his help. He's coming back. He didn't even have shoes anymore. And he was heavy. He's like, I'm no longer worthy. But you see, he wasn't worthy. He was, we're never worthy to be called God's son. And what is so awesome is that God still, his blood makes us worthy. His blood, it just covers us. There's nothing we can do to earn it. David couldn't earn God's forgiveness. He had to just ask for it. And the prodigal son, he had just squandered away everything. And when he came back, there was nothing he did to earn it. He just came home. And so I am just imploring you to come home. David came home and he said, God, forgive me. For I am conscious of my rebellion and my sin is always before me. That's just like the prodigal son. I'm not worthy. I've sinned against you. You alone I have sinned, and I've done this evil in your sight. And that's what the prodigal son says. I have sinned against you, and I've sinned against heaven. 
Do you realize what God's asking us to realize is that we've sinned. We've fallen short of the glory of God and just say, God, forgive me. And here's what God says. He says, I forgive you. I forgive you. It says, um, surely you desire integrity in the inner self. You teach me wisdom deep within. Purify me. Purify me. Make me whiter as snow. Let me hear joy and gladness. And then... um, Create a clean heart for me and renew a steadfast spirit within me. Don't take away your presence. And that's what, when David came and this prodigal son came home, that's what our Heavenly Father does. He renews in us a clean spirit. He makes us clean. And I love it at the the end of Psalms 51. David says here, Because you're not pleased with the burnt offering. The sacrifice that pleases you, God, is a broken spirit. God, you will not despise a broken spirit and a humble heart. My friend, I don't know what you've done in your life. I don't know the guilt that you're trying to carry. David was carrying a lot of guilt. He had a man killed. He slept with the man's wife. And that sin cost him dearly. God wants to remove your guilt. He wants to remove your shame. He wants to. He's already done it. And if you will just come to him with a contrite and broken and humble spirit, a humble spirit God will lift up. That's what God is looking for. He's not looking for perfect performance. He's not looking for world records, national records. God is just looking for someone who is humble, someone who will just come home to God and say, God, I'm sorry. Friend, you don't have to do anything to earn God's love. He already loves you as much as he is ever going to love you. He's already made a way for you to come home. He's already forgiven your guilt, forgiven your shame, forgiven your sins. What he wants now is a relationship with you. It's not about doing good things to earn his favor, to earn his approval, to earn his love. It's about being in a relationship with him, coming home, letting him wrap his arms around you. Let him guide you, lead you. All these things we've been studying, provide for you, share with you what's on his heart. That's when life really takes on meaning. And when you can see your heavenly father as one who is ready to wrap his arms around you, you will come out of hiding. You will come out of those places of slavery and you will come home. And so that is the desire of my heart for you to realize that God loves you. He is compassionate toward you. He is waiting for you to come out from behind the bushes, to come out of the pigsty, to come home so he can give you all that he wants to give you so he can bring you out of the bondage and restore restore your life and give to you what is yours as a child of God to put on the robe of righteousness to give you that ring of authority and to give you the place of a son to give you those shoes to bring you out of slavery I want to share with you as I close out tonight's broadcast something that changed the way that changed my relationship with God It was about a year and a half ago, and I was really struggling because I've struggled for many, many years trying to perform for God, to um, please Him. I just thought that's what I needed to do. I needed to be perfect, not for salvation, but I just thought, you know what? I need to really do a lot of good in this ministry. I need to have um, a big ministry. I need to... um, act a certain way. I need to do everything perfect so God is pleased. And if I do that, God will have a smile on his face. I'll have his blessings. And the Lord showed me probably about a year and a half ago where that mindset came from. And it came from this. And I do not cast any blame at all on my parents because the reality was they were there to hug me in the good times and they were there to hug me in the bad times. This has nothing to do with them. But what I saw when I was running to my daddy is how happy those victories made him. 
when I would train, we had this, this bribery system of if I learned this new trick on a trick ski, I would earn, you know, a couple of dollars or I'd get this certain toy or whatever it was. We, we kind of bargained. Hey, you go do this, you get this. And so what the Lord showed me, nothing was wrong with that at all. But I took that mindset of if you perform well, you earn something. If, you, if I performed well in a tournament, then I got a new national record or I got a trophy or I got a paycheck or everybody around me is smiling and running and celebrating. And, and so that's how I went through life. That's what I wanted because that feels good. <laughs> and so I carried that though into my relationship with God and especially when I went into ministry. I knew that I was saved by grace. I knew that my salvation, my entrance to heaven came through grace alone, through the death of Jesus Christ, through the shed blood of Jesus, through his resurrection power. I have been raised from death to life as well. I knew that. Had no problem with that. But what I did have a problem was with understanding that God loved me unconditionally and that he was compassionate toward me. That I didn't have to go have a big ministry to have him pleased. I didn't have to do everything right for him to smile. The Bible says he loves us. For God so loved the world, not because I did something good. He just loved me because I'm his child. And he has given me his very best in what he gave when he gave his son, Jesus. For God so loved me and he so loved you. He so loved the world that he gave his one and only begotten son that whosoever should believe shall have eternal life. Not whosoever shall do perfect things, have a big ministry, never say a cuss word. No, it's whoever would believe. And it talks about you, unless you have faith, it is impossible to please God. That's what pleases God. And then it's when we have faith in God and we come to know him as a loving father, not someone we got to perform for, please, or... Um, or be perfect for. No, someone that we just come home to, have a relationship with him, trust him, listen. Out of that, we begin to know him and it changes everything. And we start serving him, not because we have to, but because we want to. We start going to church, not because we have to, because we want to. We start reading the Word of God, not because we have to, but because we want to. We get to. We get to pray. We get to worship. We get to have a relationship with Heavenly Father, the God of this universe, the one who is our good shepherd, the one who is our provider, the one who is our protector, the one who is our covering, the one who is our door, the one who gives us good gifts. We get to have a relationship with him. And I hope that through this series that you've gotten a glimpse of just how good God is so that you can experience the abundant life that he died to give you so that you can have more. There is more than the pigsty that you've been living in. There is more than the rat race of life that you've been living in and anxiety and fear. There is more and more is experienced in a relationship with your heavenly father. Go experience the more. I love you, and I am so thankful that you joined me tonight. And as always, I just want to say, if there's anything that our ministry can do for you, please do not hesitate to contact our ministry. And if you haven't done so already, please like us on Facebook, on our Facebook page. Subscribe to our channel on YouTube. Share it. Like it. Let people know about it so their life can be changed and they can experience the more too. There's going to be some slides coming up, ways you can connect with us. If you're an inmate, there's the address there and ways that you can um, come into our ministry and be a part of our Victorious Living family. There's also some slides there that tell you how you can partner with us. If you're watching on YouTube and you'd like to be a part of our Victorious Living family as a donor, as a, as a partner. We need your support. We need these videos to be going into prisons. We need these videos to be broadcast. And we need our magazine, Victorious Living, to go forth and deliver hope. And we can do that with your support. 
God bless you and have a wonderful night and a great week. Bye-bye.